All right. Good morning. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Brandon. Uh, I've been coming out to New Life for uh, a long time. Uh, you know, I, I like being at advances. It reminds me of my first experience with New Life. That was all the way back in 05 at an advance. I came because my roommates dragged me there. Those two over there, Matt and Andy. And I don't know if any of us were Christians, honestly, at the time. Probably not, but I was there just to have fun and, you know, play games and, you know, just hang out with my friends. And I remember sitting there because uh, there was these two special guests that had just arrived, and that was Jason and Christina. They were, it was their first time ever visiting New Life. And so, you know, we're kind of connected there. We're, you know, we both started coming out at the same time. And I remember talking with Jason. He probably does not remember this. And I was like, why did they move here? Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And so I was like, and I wasn't a believer at the time, so, you know, he's probably trying to gauge the spirituality of us, you know, and like I was the worst person to talk to at that time. So, um, yeah, but it was good that way. Um, so, you know, we, so I came out in 05 and I started following Jesus shortly after that. And God really, you know, he had to get over this one major issue, you know, in my life. And I remember last night Ed was talking, and I want to get this quote right because I love that he said that. Did you ever have a moment where you realized that you were living a lie? And that, that stuck out to me because that's totally what happened in my life because I grew up in the church, you know, grew up going every Sunday. My grandfather was a minister, and so I thought I was a Christian. And then I came to school at OSU, and I found out I wasn't. And, you know, shortly after I started following Jesus, God was still dealing with an issue in my life, and that was pride. That's kind of what Ed was addressing last night. And I'll never forget the moment where I realized that I was living that lie where it was all about me. I was, I was reading one day in Luke 15, and I was watching the sermon, and this guy was being interviewed who was dying of cancer. And I'll never forget this moment because the guy, they asked him you know, some question. I don't even remember that, but he looked up and he was like, I remember praying saying, God, you could kill me right now, and it would be totally okay. And then as I'm reading Luke 15... Because I was thinking, why would he say that? You know, that, that's kind of strange. And as I'm reading Luke 15, it's the prodigal son parable. And I'm reading it, and I was always struggling with this idea of, why, aren't, why don't I have joy? Why don't I get to love Jesus and worship him like I see other people doing? And I, I read the prodigal son, and for the first time in my life, I noticed the second son in that story. And if you get a chance, read it this weekend. Because it's amazing, but I had, it was almost like the whole, my whole life that story had been hidden from me until that one moment. And I read it because the son, the second son, is off in the distance and he's angry at his brother coming home. And he's angry because his dad celebrates his brother and not him. And he says, why didn't you give me the fattened calf? You know, why didn't you throw this party for me? And his dad, it's so amazing, he says, son, you've been with me this whole time. And everything that is mine is yours. And that was the moment where my pride completely broke. And I was devastated. We had this little prayer closet. And I went in there and I was, because I was afraid someone would see me because I was crying so hard. And so I was just in there just praying. And, and that was the moment I can trace back to where God really broke my pride. And, you know, it happened. And again, Ed's quote last night was when we replace the object of worship, pride rises up in us. And that's exactly what had happened. Instead of worshiping Jesus, I was worshiping myself. And therefore, I was angry at, at people's repentance. I was, I was that older brother. And pride, the consequence is that it exalts us to a place that we should not be. Okay? It exalts us to a place that we should not be. And today I want to look at, okay, first, how does God deal with pride? Okay? And then I want to look at the solution to pride. All right? So I want to look at a couple stories. You don't have to open there right away, but uh, Ed kind of touched on this with Satan. Okay, all think back to Genesis 3, okay, the fall. And Satan is the picture of pride, okay? He's the father of it. He's the father of lies, all right? And so in the fall, he's talking to Eve, and he says, you know, oh, did God really say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve responds back to him, no, he said we, we could eat of anything except for this tree or touch it lest we die. And then Satan says something really, he says, well, surely God knows that you will become like him when you eat it. So he's lying to her, saying, you know what, Eve, you can actually become like God. And that's the thing of pride right there. Pride tells you that it puts you up on that level with God. And so that's exactly what Satan was doing from the beginning. 
And the amazing thing is when God comes and talks to them, but he curses, you know, the ground. He has women have childbirth and pains and that. But the amazing thing, I never understood why he cursed the snake. It seems so weird to me that he would, you know, curse him. And until I got to thinking about what, what humility is and what this idea of, of pride and what the consequence is. And it's amazing because what happened was Satan was trying to exalt himself to the same throne as God. That's what it said in Isaiah 14 last night. And God, as a picture to us, curses the snake so that it has to crawl on the ground. I want you to think about that for a moment. It says, cursed are you because you will crawl and eat dust, is what it says. So you'll be slithering on the ground. And think about it. He's the lowest creature ever. The snake it has to crawl on the ground, okay? And so I think God gave us that as a picture of what happens when we try to exalt ourselves to him, is that we will be humbled, okay? And I get that in a few other places. I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 4. Kind of like the middle of your Bible, be Daniel. See Isaiah, go to the right more. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. That's where it's at. Daniel chapter 4. And there's this interesting character. Um, I'm sure you've heard of his name, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he's the ruler of Babylon at the time. If you remember the story of Daniel, Daniel has, he can interpret dreams, and Nebuchadnezzar has his first dream about all these kingdoms, and then he has a second dream, which is really interesting. It's about this tree that he sees, and all the branches are cut off by this person, and then it's like forgotten, this tree, and then one day it, it blooms again, okay? And in, and in Daniel 4, what's going on is that God is showing Nebuchadnezzar what's about to happen to him. He's about to have his kingdom stripped away from him, and it's interesting why he's having his kingdom stripped away. It's because of pride, because he's exalting himself. And God says that I'm going to curse you, and you're going to become like a cow, and you're going to eat grass of the field, and you're going to be crazy. And that's exactly what happens. One day, Nebuchadnezzar was sitting on his, por- on his like porch, looking, overlooking the city, and he says, wow, aren't I great? Look at this kingdom I have built. Look at my majesty. And it said at that moment, God spoke to him, and he drove him off. But then he says he would humble him and he would return. And I want you to look at Daniel 4, verse 34. It says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom. And still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And so this story, we see that Nebuchadnezzar was lifting himself up to God's level, and God humiliated him, okay, and then restored him. And the first thing Nebuchadnezzar does is praise God for his greatness. He worships God. So God brings him low so that he's able to see how great he is. That's what, that's what the heart of worship is, okay? And we see that, and it says that um, he is able, sorry, those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I love that statement. I want to see one more instance, okay? Go to Second Chronicles. That's backwards in your Bible, towards the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. That goes... Second Chronicles 26.
Second Chronicles 26, starting verse 16. It's about a king in Israel. Again, very prideful. Okay, His name is Uzziah. Don't get him confused with Uzzah, the guy who was carrying the Ark of the Covenant and died because of it when King David was reigning. This is Uzziah. Okay, um, But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went after or went in after him with eighty priests of the Lord who were men of valor. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out to the go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of all the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out, because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the, of the king's household, um, governing the people of the land. Verse 22, Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from the first to the last, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote. And Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the burial field that belongs to the kings, for they said, He is a leper. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. So we have this incredible story here of this guy who is being so prideful that he thinks he can worship God on his own terms. Right? He thinks he can go in and doesn't matter what God says, I'm going to do this practice that only a certain person can do. So it's very prideful of him to think that. And then he does, he's trying to do it and these priests are like, no, don't do this. And as he's about to do the, burn the incense, God has leprosy break out on him. Kind of as a punishment. And, and think about this, it's a king who has everything he could want. Okay? Everything. He's got all the money, power, he has his palace, and then he gets leprosy, and I love what it says, that he has to move into a separate house away from everyone. And he's that way until his death. And in fact, when they bury him, they bury him in a separate field because he has leprosy. It's just so humiliating to this guy. And I want you to see this, that God humbles pride. Okay? God humbles pride and when you're so prideful, it's not a good thing the way he humbles it. Okay? We see these stories after story in the Old Testament of God humiliating people because they think that they're putting themselves up on the level with God. And so that's the danger. There is a big danger here when we're talking about pride. And something really interesting, okay? So King Uzziah was prideful. And I love the ending because it mentions Isaiah prophet. I think that's so cool because go to Isaiah chapter 6. I know I'm having you flip around a lot. Isaiah chapter 6. First sentence, 6-1. Make sure everybody's there, sorry. Got a lot of flipping. Alright, Isaiah 6-1. In the year that King Uzziah, okay, this is in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, this is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I just want to pause there for a moment. So in the year King Uzziah died, the king who was so prideful that he tried to put himself up on a level with God. Isaiah the prophet has a vision of God on his throne. 
just see that for a second. So he has to be shown this is who the king is of the universe. And Isaiah is is the, the, the prophet of the time. And so God is showing him this is who I am. He gives him a glimpse into that throne room. And the amazing thing is who this is that he sees on the throne. Because in John chapter 12, the, later on in this, in Isaiah here, it says that he spoke to them in parables and that they're never going to listen. Well, in John 12, it's talking about Jesus. And John, the gospel writer, says that Isaiah said these things because he saw his, Jesus, glory. When did he see Jesus? Right here. So Isaiah is getting a glimpse of the king of the universe, and that's what's going on in this story here. So he's seeing the real king, and his first response to it, woe is me. He quickly realizes he doesn't deserve to see this. Okay? And that's the solution to pride. It's when you realize that you are not deserving of everything that God gives us. Okay? And that's what we see in Isaiah. And some want a definition of humility. And the best thing I can come up with is it's knowing your place. Okay? It is knowing your place. With God, He's the Creator. He created creation that testifies to Him. We talked about that last night. But then we're the, His created beings here. And so we have a place that's below angels, above animals. Okay? That means knowing our place. That's where we get the word human from. It's actually a derivative of the word humility. Okay? It's knowing our place. And God, he, he, you have to be humiliated to see how great God is. I want you to see that, okay? So Isaiah was brought into the throne room, realized how huge God was. He not only worshipped him, but then he realized who he was and not deserving of it, okay? But there's another characteristic of humility. And to see that, we have to go to Philippians 2, okay? So humility is knowing our place, specifically when it comes to God. That we don't deserve anything He's ever given us. Philippians 2, we're going to start in verse 1. Um, So there's another characteristic of humility. It's not just knowing our place. Philippians 2, verse 1. This is Paul writing. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So you know what he's saying there? You want to make me happy? Paul's writing to his people here. Have the same mind. Okay? That would make me so happy if you guys all thought the same way here. But what are they thinking? Verse 3. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Pause there. If you want a definition of humility, you should always go to the Bible. Okay, that's where you should always get your your biblical definitions from. All right, and here it says, in humility count others more significant than yourselves. All right, so pride not only is knowing our place, but it's also a characteristic of You've got to consider people more than yourself. And Paul is going to lay out an argument here as to why we should do that. Okay? Why should we do that? Verse 4, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Okay? So we can have this mind right now. We can think this way. Who, in verse 6, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So let me pause there. Jesus is God. We've seen him on the throne. And what Paul is saying is, God did not think that he could be equal with God when he came on this earth. That's how he was thinking. So he's being humble. He was considering someone else above himself. Okay? And he humbled himself by coming in human form. And then look what else it says. Made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men, verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let me pause there. 
So not only was he so humble and thinking about others, he was humble to the point of death, but not just any death, death on a cross. And if you remember back when Andy was talking about how humiliating the cross was for a, a form of punishment, it was torture. So he was tortured, suffered extreme agony that we made a word for it called excruciating, means from the cross. That's how painful it was. So not only was he humble, but he also was so humble that he died in a humble way, in an extremely torturous way. And so Paul is laying this out for us as this should be our mindset. And he continues, so he dies for us on a cross. Therefore, so because he did all of that, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, if you're concerned about greatness, okay, which is what pride does, it puts you up here and you want to be great and awesome, but look at the picture of Jesus. okay? Jesus was humble and then was exalted to the highest place you could ever be. He was already there. That's what's amazing. So it means he was in the form of God. He saw him on the throne here in Isaiah 6. He was already God, comes down, and then God exalts him again. And there's no one that can be higher than him. Look at what it says. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, that's angels, on the earth, that's demons, that's us, and under the earth, that's everyone who's ever lived, and every tongue, so any language, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no one that can get up there. That's what he's saying. So he's trying to get us into a mindset saying, we are below God. And then he's saying, you know what you need to do? Is you need to think about others before you think about yourself. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. I want to, lastly, I want to look at Colossians 3, okay? It's just the next book over. So, pride causes us to put us up on a pedestal where we don't belong. God humiliates us, either in a form of, you know, just total, uh, unrepentant, uh, uncontrollable, where he just does it. And it looks, you know, we look miserable because of it. That's how God's going to deal with pride. Or we can be like Isaiah, where we see God, we realize who we are, and we worship him. Okay? But to get to that place, it's important. We have to be able to get from pride to humility. Because all of us struggle with pride. Because that's the lie in this world. From the beginning, Satan has been doing this, lying to us, saying that we can be like God. And that's what every lie is going to have a root in that. Okay? So, from the beginning, he's been saying that. These are all the lies. So how do we get to humility? I want to look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. So it says, If then, in verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ. So let me pause for a second. If you have been raised with Christ. That's a big qualifier there. If you've been raised with Christ, what does that mean? Do you follow Jesus? That's the question. Everyone has to ask. Do you actually follow Jesus? Or are you some sort of fan of His? If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Again, picture of where Jesus is. He's, he's right there. You can't ever get there. He's right there next to God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. What he's doing is laying out the gospel for us. Some think the gospel is just, my sins are forgiven, I believe in Jesus. That's actually half true. All half truths are lies, so that's not the full gospel. The full gospel is we've died with Jesus and we've been given new life in Him. Okay? 
That's who we are as believers when you worship Jesus. When you have the Holy Spirit, that's who we are. We're found in Him. That's what it says. For you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. That's talking about the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. That's our faith. That's our promise that we have. That because He did it, we will also do it. So Paul's laying out the Gospel here. So if you believe that, that's a problem. But Paul is talking to believers here. So how should we respond? Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Those first lists of sins, those all have to do with how you relate to other people. You personally are lusting. You personally are coveting towards other people. And when you're doing that, it's all about you. So what idolatry is. You put yourself equal with God. So Paul is saying, put that to death. Put it to death. Verse 6, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. That's what Ed was talking about last night. In these you two once walked. In these we once walked. What's that mean? That means that we are dead to our old selves. Okay? We should never be expecting to walk in those. Ever. Okay? So we put those to death. And But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Again, that's about other people. You have wrath towards other people. Malice, anger, slandering, and obscene talk. Then it says, verse 9, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek nor Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So do you know what he's saying here? He's giving us a list of things of how we usually deal with people, how the people in the world will deal with each other. They'll be evil towards each other. They'll talk bad about each other. And Paul is saying that's not who you are in Christ. In Jesus, you've actually died to those things. Now let me pause here. You will still sin as a Christian. Make that very clear. But you are not expected to sin. Okay, and let me pause there. That's a weird statement. We will still sin, but you're not expected to sin. Okay, and what that means is that if you sin, it should be normal for you to go, wow, I've messed up. Okay? That should be a normal reaction to us. You shouldn't be looking at this list going, oh yeah, I want those things. I want to do that. No, what should be happening is you go, man, I don't want to be that way. Pride tells you you don't need a sacrifice. You don't need forgiveness. Humility tells you you need this. Okay? So, what should we be doing? Verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones. That's who you are. You are a chosen one of God. Jesus, before the foundation of the world, if you believe in Him, wrote your name in a book. Can't be taken out ever. That's who we are in Jesus. And Paul is saying this. This is who you are. This is who you can be. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So, Paul is saying to us, This is who we should be. This is who we should be seeking to be. It's a humble people, okay, who think about others above ourselves. And it's knowing our place, who we are in Jesus. That's so important. We are in Christ as we're made alive with Him, and we don't have to be put in slavery again, which is what sin does. It causes us to be in slavery. It's all about us. Everything is about you and sin. And we don't have to be that way. We can be like Christ through Him. And that's what Paul is saying. But how do we get to that point? And that's one word. It's repentance. Okay? It is repentance. That's how you get there. And trust me, I answer yes to a lot of those things on that list. Okay? About that I need to put things to death. Because we're constantly fighting against that temptation and there's this war that goes on in us that wants to put ourselves with God. And we see the results of that in Scripture. That's not a good... So every time I'm, I'm tempted, I go, God, this is not who I want to be. 
I don't want to be that. I want to be like Jesus. And so how we get there is repentance. And let me make something very clear. God loves repentance. He loves it. So if you're believing the lie that says God's going to be angry with you, know that that's from Satan. Know that that's from him. Think about it. Satan is prideful, doesn't want you to ever think about God being more high than you. and exalt, He wants you to be exalted there, so you don't need forgiveness. That's been the lie from the beginning. And then with repentance, it says, we can just turn to God and confess our sin, and he will forgive us. Through Jesus, that's what he's done. But the lie is that God's going to be angry with me if I do that. Well, that's not true. And I want you guys to, last verse, I promise, Luke 15, because this will change your life if you actually get this. I realize that some of you have already heard this. I may have already spoken on it, but I just love this picture. So in Luke 15, verse 1, notice the setting. Now the tax collectors and sinners, horrible people to the Pharisees, scum of the earth, okay? Tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to him, to hear him, Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them, trying to disqualify him. Look, sinners are coming to Jesus. That guy can't be the Messiah. And then Jesus gives three very specific pictures of how God responds to our repentance. Each time it mentions the word repentance, okay, in every story. And the one that I love here is uh, in the parable of the lost coin, okay? It's an obscure one. It's not the most famous one. most famous is probably the prodigal son, and then the sheep are right after that. Lost coin, or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the lost coin. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. A lot of people, when you read that, you'll go, Yes, angels rejoice when we repent. Just like when you ring a bell, an angel gets wings. Right? It's that weird, those weird things that we think. But that's not what it says. It says there's joy before the angels of God. So someone is rejoicing before them and they're seeing it. And that's God. Jesus is rejoicing at that. And you see it in the parables, okay? You see that. Because the shepherd who loses a sheep says, doesn't he call his friends and rejoice? I found my lost sheep. Who's the shepherd in the story? It's not us. We're sheep. It's Jesus. Woman with a lost coin, she's seeking diligently for it. Never letting it go. Same with the prodigal son. It's the father who throws the party. It's the Father, and so He loves repentance. And so we're going to enter into a time of that. That's our next phase here, the advance. And I want you, if, if you can take away one thing, I want you to know that God will humiliate pride. Okay? He will do it. Either in this life, or when you have to bow your knee before Jesus, knowing that you lived your life as a lie. Or you can be like Isaiah, when you see Jesus, you can worship Him fully, when you understand your place, okay? And that is we are far below God. And he gives us the opportunity, this is so amazing, to believe in him and then be like him. That's what's amazing. And so if you take something away, it's that we can all repent of this and that God will forgive us for our pride. And that's actually being humble, okay? And so let me close this out in prayer, and that's what we're going to be doing next, is we're going to be talking about repentance and what it means to turn back to God, confess our sins to each other, and worship Him truly. So let me pray for us. Father, we just thank You so much for Your Word, Jesus, and and getting to see You today in Your Word. And I pray that no one will remember what I've said in the flesh, but that they would just remember Your Word, Jesus. That they would remember You, and that You would look great and that we would remember that we can turn to you and that it's not something that you're going to hate us for, but in fact you're going to rejoice about it because we're being humble people who you've called us to be. And so I just ask that um, we would take this seriously now and confessing our sins to you. Um, and I pray that, that we would all learn from this and just really 
be people that are quick to confess our sin, quick to realize how thankful and, and merciful you are um, and, and gracious in giving us life, Jesus. So I just pray for that, and I just ask that this time would be amazing for us to connect with you and truly worship you for who you are, Jesus. So we just thank you and pray these things in your name. Amen.